I, my church is used to me saying I'm excited. And after like three months of me saying I was excited, beginning of every sermon, I had to reassure them. I mean it every time. And every time I've been up here over the last five years, I have been excited. And today I am truly excited to be with you. And I want to start by saying thank you. Uh, I know how many people have been a part of this um, culture, this, this movement, this thing called the convention for a very, very long time and multiple generations. Um, I have not. I have been, uh, my first convention was 2018, and I uh, became a, the senior pastor of Turner Christian Church later that year, and the welcome that I have received here has been tremendous. And I think it says a lot about a movement and an organization that can have roots as deep as it goes and be so generous in welcoming new people. And I think that's a very good sign, and I'm truly appreciative for um, your welcome of myself and my wife and just the way we have been incorporated into this body. Before I start feel like I should apologize for one thing. My wife and I worked, thought and prayed a lot and worked hard to find two excellent uh, keynote speakers for this, um, for this convention, and we advertised them. Uh, we have Dr. Melissa Ortiz Berry, and we have Dr. John Mark Hicks. Dr. Berry's already with us. Dr. John Mark Hicks is landing like now. Um, and they're going to be joining with us, and they are great. Uh, the apology is I'm not either one of them. When I met with them and we talked about the vision that Casey and I and our team have for this convention and what we want it to be and what we want you to receive from it, and we got to a point where the two of them said, you know, it kind of sounds like you should start. It sounds like you should tell people wh what, you're, what you're going for, what we're trying to achieve with this convention, and then we'll fill out the rest. And so I'm starting today, and I'm starting our read-through of Ephesians with chapter 3. Because that's where our key passage is. Tomorrow we'll, we'll go with chapter 1 with Dr. Hicks and then we will go through the rest of it. But tonight we're going to be in Ephesians chapter 3 because this is the core of what we, are, what we hope to do with this week. From the very beginning, there's something that I've always loved about camps and about conventions and about the way we get to celebrate the manifold wisdom of God when we gather and it just energizes me. It makes me into an extrovert. And so Casey and I, from the minute they kind of metaphorically gave us the keys and told us we could drive, we've been excited about being able to um, shape that vision. And so today, I'm going to be speaking to you out of our key passage that is in Ephesians chapter 3. And our, our vision for this convention is that we want the, the days to equip you to the, do the work of the church. But we want the evenings to be set aside for celebrating what God is doing through the church and for celebrating what God is doing through your church. And in order to be able to celebrate what God is doing through the church, we need to be able to identify what God is doing through the church. And so today, I want to cast a vision for how we can identify what it is that God is doing through the church. Because when we want to have conversations about how things are going and be able to, uh, one of the important things they teach you in leadership is you need to have measurable goals so that you can actually tell whether you're moving forward or not. But in our emphasis, oh, we didn't dismiss the kids. I apologize. The kids um, can... <laughs> Go over to this door here, I believe. They've already gone. So kids, if you're in the kids program, um, you can see them right out here. You can go ahead and leave out the, this side and join the kids, the rest of them. Did they all make it? Teens, stay with us. Elementary, go. And have fun. Okay. Where was I? Now you have to remember where I was. Okay, so <laughs> it's the first night of convention. Um, what's that? Victories in the churches. What is God doing 
through the church. And when we're, when we, we want to be able to measure it. And so we end up looking at a lot of numbers. You know, the Christian Standard has a, uh, uh, the magazine has a, an issue that talks about the metrics that you can measure. How many baptisms did you have? How many members did you have? And we look at how much their giving is. And, and those are good numbers for us to look at. But very often, I think we end up with tunnel vision about what the victories in the church actually look like. And one of the phrases that Paul uses in our passage today is the manifold wisdom of God. Manifold is not a word that we use very much anymore outside of engines, but the word manifold and the Greek word behind it, refer. it's also translated as rich variety, many faceted. Think of a stained glass window, that the wisdom of God has many facets, it has many pieces to it, it looks in many different ways. And so we need to have a manifold vision of what God is doing in the church. And so today, what I want to do is from this passage in Paul, I want to just work out for us the whole broad umbrella of what kinds of victories God is accomplishing in the churches. Because I think that as we understand the manifold wisdom of God, we will be able to appreciate more of what God is doing in our churches, in all of our churches. So, Let's go to our theme passage, and I'm going to read, I'm going to start in verse 8 so that we can get the complete thought going into verse 10 and 11. Paul says this, Although I am less than the least of all the Lord's people, this grace was given to me, to preach to the Gentiles the boundless riches of Christ, and to make plain to everyone the administration of this mystery, which for ages past was kept hidden in God, who created all things. His intent was that now, through the church, The manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms according to his eternal purpose that he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. So according to Paul, if we want to cast the broadest vision that we can of what God intends to accomplish through the church, he says that God intends to to demonstrate his manifold wisdom to the world. He says the powers and authorities in the heavenly places, uh, in in Paul's worldview, there is a very dotted line between the powers of the world and the spiritual powers behind them and the spiritual powers that the governments invoke. And so he's basically saying we're demonstrating to the world the manifold wisdom of God. That is what the church is supposed to do, which begs the question, what is the manifold wisdom of God? Well, there are two clues that it, it, it would make more sense if we've been reading the whole book but we haven't been yet. We just jumped in. So there's two routes that we can take to fill in what the manifold wisdom of God is. First of all, in those verses leading into our main passage, Paul talks about how God has, God has given him the grace to reveal the mystery of God in his preaching. So what is that mystery? Well, God def- or Paul defines that verse, that mystery in verse 6. He says, this mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel members together of one body, and sharers together in the promise of Christ Jesus. So, the manifold wisdom of God is made known to the world through the church in connection with Paul preaching that God is opening the kingdom to Jews and Gentiles together. That is a key part of the manifold wisdom of God. Now, it's hard for us to understand just how revolutionary that was, but understand that this was coming at a time when Jews had been practicing centuries of segregation from Gentiles, and that was the thing that Jews were known for, was for not mixing with others and not really considering non-Jews open to the news about God. And so this was something unlooked for. It was a mystery that was hidden, that was unexpected, and it was shocking to the people that heard it. The other clue that we get to the manifold wisdom of God is the fact that Paul, in our key passage, says that he is revealing it according to his eternal purpose that he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. If you had read chapter 1 and chapter 2 leading into this, you would already know God's purpose through Jesus Christ because Paul has told us in two places going into that. In chapter 1, verse 8, it says, With all wisdom and understanding, God made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times reach their fulfillment, to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. 
So evidently, the purpose that God has in mind through Christ is to unite all things under Christ. This is flushed out more in chapter 2, when he says, beginning in verse 15, Christ's purpose in dying on the cross was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace, and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. So the purpose, Jesus Christ's purpose in coming and dying on the cross was to reconcile human beings to each other and to reconcile humanity to God. Now, it's hard for us to understand, again, the, the, how radical that point is after 2,000 years of the influence of the gospel. So let me take us back a little bit into the experience of the Roman Empire at the time that Paul was writing. The Roman Empire experienced division and tension on a level that we cannot even imagine. Uh, by the time Paul is ministering, the Roman Empire has had a series of civil wars of slave rebellions, of social tension, of all kinds of conflict, and it is a very unstable place to live. Even in times of peace, let me describe to you what it would be like to live in the city of Antioch, which is where Paul cut his teeth as a missionary. The city of Antioch was about two square miles, so a little bit larger than Turner. It had a population of 150,000 which is a little bit less than the city of Salem. There was one single resident house for every 26 blocks of apartment buildings with no building codes. They collapsed all the time. And this city of 150,000 crammed into two square miles was divided into 19 different ethnic enclaves, different ethnic neighborhoods, you know, like Little Italy and Chinatown, there were 19 of them, and they were constantly fighting with each other. Crime was so bad, and gang warfare and rioting were so bad that it was commonly said that a person would be a fool to go out at night without first writing their will. In fact, it was said that the only reason why cities, or statistics have shown the only reason why the cities maintain their population was because of a constant influx of people moving to the cities. They were predominantly first generation city dwellers because that's how hard it was to survive in an ancient city. Not only was the Roman Empire filled with danger and chaos and division, but another thing that we know about that time is that the religions of the time were crumbling. People were abandoning the temples and the religions in droves because what they found was that they were completely unsatisfying, especially on the level of connecting with the divine. So archaeologists have uncovered that the decline of the temples started long before the rise of Christianity, and people began complaining about empty temples before Jesus was even born. And we also see a lot of fad religions coming through as people are searching for something to give them to a connection to whoever is out there, and they, and they fail to satisfy. And so for the people of the Roman Empire, the need to be reconciled with each other and the need to be reconciled with whoever is out there is a very desperately felt need. So much so that the main claim that people would make to power, especially the Caesars, was to say, we are the ones who can reconcile you. Caesar said, I am the one who brings peace. At the tip of my soldiers' swords, I bring peace, I unite you, and because I am the son of a God, I can connect you with the divine. And there were all kinds of powers in the world that were telling people that we can reconcile you to each other, we can reconcile you to the gods, we can bring peace and unity to the world. This is why Paul says that they're making a point to the powers and, and authorities in the heavenly realms because there was so much competition for the claim of who could really bring people together, who could really unite people with God. And so what Paul is saying 
is that God's goal for the church, the place of God's church in his plan, is to prove to the world that when Jesus Christ says, I am the one who can reconcile you to each other, I am the one who can reconcile you to God, that that claim is true and it can be trusted because it is proven by the witness of the church. The church makes the manifold wisdom of God known to the world by making the gospel credible. By conspicuously being saved. By testifying to the world that here the promises of reunion, the promises of reconciliation, the promises of peace are actually kept. And so... The mission of the church is to make the manifold wisdom of God known to the world. And the mission of the church is to, we do that by demonstrating the power of the gospel. Now, how do we demonstrate the power of the gospel? For that, we turn to the next section in chapter 3 of Ephesians where Paul prays for the Ephesians and he prays that God would prepare and equip them for the mission of demonstrating the wisdom of God to the powers and authorities. And here's what he says. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Do you see the heartbeat of that passage? Do you see the core of what Paul is praying for the church? He prays that they will be rooted and established in love. That they will have the power to grasp how wide and long and high and deep the love of Christ is. That they will know the love that surpasses knowledge that they will be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. The core of what it means to demonstrate the power of the gospel, it's not to be, go out there and say we are better than everyone else. It's not to say, look at how good I am and how little wrong I do. Because often we get caught up in that sense of showing we are the saved ones because we are holier than thou. And what that actually ends up happening is we cover up our mistakes. And when they get found out, we're caught denying the gospel because we're caught pretending that we're not sinners. But we don't demonstrate the gospel by pretending that we're not sinners, by proving that we've stopped sinning, that we're better than others. We demonstrate the gospel by demonstrating the power that Jesus Christ has to reconcile us to God and to each other. And so we prove the gospel by being conspicuously reconciled to others. And we prove reconciliation by living out the love of God. Because love is the proof of reconciliation. And if you have siblings and have ever been forced by your parents to apologize to your siblings, you know what I am talking about. If you are a parent who have made your children apologize to each other, you know what I'm talking about. Casey and I picked up a trick in a parenting book and it works well enough for us now. I mean, our oldest is four, so we'll see how long it lasts. But the trick is when one apologizes and the other says, Uh, I forgive you, then they have to hug until they giggle. Because giggling is hard to fake. Because it is really easy to say the words of reconciliation and to not feel them and to not be reconciled. It's very easy to say, I'm sorry, and not be sorry. It's very easy to say, I forgive you, and not forgive. It's very easy to say, we are reconciled, and as soon as your parents turn their back, you're right back at each other's throats. The proof of reconciliation is in love. Because the Roman Empire, sure, they can put down a rebellion at the point of a sword. But how much love do you think comes out of that? How much reconciliation comes out of that? Love is the difference between reconciliation and coercion. Right? You can force people to stop fighting. But love proves that it's genuine. Because what would happen in the Roman Empire is as soon as they took the swords away, everybody would go back to fighting. Or as soon as one of those people at the point of a sword got a sword of their own, they went back to fighting. 
But as the Roman government and all these other entities are putting all this work into controlling people, in the midst of all of that, there's this group of people who are already reconciled, who are truly reconciled, who are obviously different because they love They act like they don't hate people in the neighboring enclaves. They act like they don't hate people who are different from them. They act like they don't hate people who wrong them. They they love. And that has to be explained because the Roman Empire spent a ton of time and a ton of money and a ton of blood to force people to obey and walk the line. And these people are, are loving people more genuinely, more naturally. They are going above and beyond simply following the law begrudgingly. They are creating this genuine community and nobody's holding them at the tip of a sword. How do you explain that? You explain that with Jesus. That's the only way you can explain that change. And so if, here's, one of the things I have loved about being coming part of the restoration movement is being able to take seriously what the Bible says about unity. And I don't mean institutional unity. I don't mean merging denominations. I don't mean any of that, those things. I mean the love that Christians are supposed to have for each other. Honestly, institutional unity, I think, is way easier than loving the person in the pew next to you who sings off key. Institutional unity is nothing. Real Christian unity is much harder and much more valuable, but it's also much, much more biblical. The Bible tells us to love God, right? How many times does the New Testament tell us to love God? I counted one. Three, if you count one story told three times in the different Gospels. How many times does it tell us to love our neighbor? I counted four, six, if you count one story told three times. Now, I believe absolutely that loving God and loving our neighbors are the core. They are the great commandments. They are the core of what it means to follow Jesus and to obey God. But somewhere in there, we've forgotten the new commandment. You know how many times we are told to love fellow Christians? I had counted 32. Apparently, it's 47. It's 32. It's at least 32. In every book, every letter written to a church is the command to love each other. It is the absolute core of what makes the church the church. The fact, not the fact that we all agree, not the fact that we all have the same priorities, not the fact that we all worship the same way or think the same way or dress the same way or anything like that, but the fact that we love Jesus and we love each other because we love Jesus. So let me give you some verses. These are just a few. I could go on. I've got the, t- oh, I don't have the time, but I could take it to read all 32, but I didn't put them all in my Kindle so that I wouldn't. So let me give you the ones I do have. First of all, it should be enough right here. This is Jesus, John 13. A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know you are my disciples. If you love one another. One another is talking about the disciples. It's talking about each other. Romans 12 says, be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. 2 Corinthians 13 says, Finally, brothers and sisters, rejoice. Strive for full restoration. Encourage one another. Be of one mind. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. Galatians 5 says, You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. 1 Peter says, Above all, love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. 1 John 3.23 says, This is his command. Believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and to love one another as he commanded us. And this last one, Colossians, I want you to think of Antioch with its 19 different ethnic enclaves and 150 people crammed in, 150,000 people in two square miles. He says, Here there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all, 
and is in all. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them together in perfect unity. The church is defined, it is set apart, and it fulfills the intent of God as we love. And especially as we love each other. Because honestly, how could this motley crew love each other without Jesus? Don't take that personally. I would say that in any church. That's the point, right? If people can explain a gathering of Christians anywhere other than Jesus, then we might need to reach out a bit. There might be other things drawing us together because what draws us ultimately together is Jesus Christ. Amen? And so what I want you to hear then is that as we ask, what is God doing through the church and what victories should we celebrate in the church, the victories that we celebrate are when we share the love of God, when we love others only because that love comes from Jesus Christ, when we do things for others that can only be explained because we love Jesus. Every single time that happens, it is a victory that we should celebrate because we are proving to the powers that God's wisdom is true and that God truly does change the world through Jesus Christ. Every time we show God's love, that is a victory worth celebrating. And you know how I know that? I know that because the love that churches show for each other was one of the victories that Paul loved to celebrate. Let me give you some examples of Paul's letters to the churches. In Ephesians chapter 1, he says, For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all God's people... I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. To the church of the Colossians, he said, We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, because we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for all God's people. To the Thessalonians, he said, We ought always to thank God for you, brothers and sisters, and rightly so, because your faith is growing more and more, and the love all of you have for one another is increasing. To Philemon, he said, I always thank my God as I remember you in my prayers because I hear about your love for all his holy people and your faith in the Lord Jesus. Paul loved to celebrate the love of the church. We should celebrate the love of the church. And here's what I want you to hear today. Growing the kingdom is absolutely important. But the tremendous growth stories that we hear are the result of a lot of pieces getting into the right point at the right time. There's a lot of work that goes into it and a lot of God's planning that makes it happen. And that happens under the right circumstances. For instance, if you are in a town whose population is shrinking, that's going to change your ability to post great numbers. Right? There are a lot of circumstances that can affect the numbers that your church can post. But every church, in every situation, under every circumstance, can experience victories in God. Victories that God is doing through your church. I don't care what the circumstances you are in. You are in. in fact, the harder the circumstances in your church, often the more inspiring, the more powerful the witness of God's love in that community. Because when things are hard, that's when it is hardest to stay together. And when the difference between staying together and not staying together is most clearly Jesus. And so I don't know what kind of church you came here from. I don't know what's been going on in your church. I don't know what the last four years have been like for you. I don't know what the last 20 years have been like for you. You may be coming in here riding high on a lot of obvious victories. You may be coming in here tired because you've been fighting hard just to keep your head above water. You, I don't know what your experience is, but I want you to know that God can be winning victories in your church today. And I believe that if you think about it, you can name some. I believe that if you look for the manifold wisdom of God in your congregation, you will see it. Now, every congregation has room for improvement, no matter what your numbers look like, no matter what the situation is. So nobody should say, oh, okay, well, that's enough love of God, so I guess we're good. 
right? We all have more opportunities to share God's love in more ways. But none of us should think that because our church is not like this church or is not doing things in that way or is not playing this role, that we are not part of God's plan, that God is just simply not working through us. Because the truth is that anything that is happening in your church can be done in a way that shows the love of God and that can only be explained as a part of his manifold witness. And the church needs every different shade of glass in the stained glass window of the manifold witness of God, the manifold wisdom of God. So I've written down some experiences, some some victories for you to consider. This is just a list that I have come up with, and clearly it does not exhaust the wisdom of God. I certainly hope not. He's got to be wiser than me. Every time you baptize a new believer, it's a victory. Amen? That's what we're all about, baptizing people into Christ. Every time you welcome a new member to your church, that's a victory. Amen? Every time, every dollar that is given to your church ministries and to missions, every dollar that is surrendered to the work of Christ is a victory. Everything you do to care for the sick and shut-ins in your congregation is a victory. Everything you do to introduce children to Jesus is a victory. Everything you do to honor and care for the elderly in your church is a victory. Everything you do to comfort and support those who mourn is a victory. Every time you heal a marriage, it's a victory. Every time you restore a hurt person's faith in Christ and in the church, that's a victory. Every time you show love for someone simply because Jesus told you to, that's a victory. Every time you love someone you were convinced you couldn't love, that's a victory. Every time you navigate division in your church compassionately, that's a victory. Every time you bear with people who struggle with change, that's a victory. Every time you keep the faith together in the face of a red budget, that's a victory. Every time you pull together to keep the church running without a senior minister or another staff position, that is a victory. And you know what? Even the way a church closes its doors can be a victory. Even the way a church closes its doors can be a victory. Westside Christian Church decided to close their doors. They sold their building, and they took their resources, and they handed them over to be used to fund new church plants. And that is a, an, an egg that is being used to plant multiple churches, and the first one is Everyone Church in Eugene. And if you're familiar with them, they are doing an amazing ministry in Eugene to the homeless. And they are partnering with a dazzling array of organizations down there, some that would never darken the door of a church, but they are willing to participate in the love that everyone church is showing to the community in Eugene. In Eugene, Oregon, that is a victory in God that came from the faithful way that a church closed their doors for the last time. Every church in every situation, has an opportunity to navigate that situation in a godly way that is a victory for God, and it is not simply the numbers that are posted. I, as I've interacted with with people and, and I've tried to come up with a biblical way to assess success, which is, I can't find a better word for what I'm talking about, but it's not the right word. In a church, I come up with this. I want you to remember this. It is the Jonah Jeremiah test. Jeremiah was the worst prophet in the Bible, the most faithless, irresolute prophet in the Bible. He ran from God. When God finally turned him around, he begrudgingly walked through the city, preached the worst sermon ever given, one sentence that wasn't very clear, and then walked outside the city to watch the city burn, and it resulted in one of the greatest revivals in the Bible. Jeremiah was one of the most faithful prophets in the Bible. He worked for decades. The first one was Jonah. The first one was Jonah. The second one is Jeremiah. Jeremiah worked for decades in the capital of God's people. 
He finished his ministry with practically nothing to show for it. He watched the temple burned because of the faithlessness of the people. And I ask you, who is a better testament to the wisdom of God? Who is a more faithful servant to God? Who has ultimately had a greater impact on the church and on the progress of God's people, Jonah or Jeremiah? Our mission is to share the love of God, to prove the gospel true. And there are so many ways that we can do that, and I've listed a bunch for you. And part of this, really, this sermon is actually all an introduction for a video that I want you to watch. What we're going to do each, week, each day this week is we're going to start with a video because we have been asking churches to send us victory videos so that we can show you. You don't just have to take my word for it. You can see the victories that are happening in our churches. And we have one for every day of the week. This one I wanted to introduce to you so that you know where it's coming from and you know why we're doing this. But I want you to watch this brief clip. It's got three of the victories that, we've been, that have been shared with us. And I love because each one of them is different. So... In the, in the future, make sure you're here at 6.30, uh, before 6.30, so you can see the others. But here's the first of our victory videos of what God is doing through our churches. Hello, Northwest Christian Convention. I'm Toby. I work at Village Church. Hi, I'm Claire Bueller from Harrisburg Christian Church. Hi, I'm Bruce White, the interim pastor at Thurston Christian Church in Springfield, and I'm excited over the past couple of months or a year, a huge kingdom win for us was that we got to send our lead pastor, Mike, and Heather on sabbatical. Even though our church is in a season of transition, we're growing. As we looked around us, we saw churches um, that were seeing a lot of division. That didn't happen with us. Our church really held together, and we only saw a couple of people maybe that peeled away, but for the most part, there was no division within our congregation, and that was such a blessing. And throughout the time, the three months that they were gone, we were able to remain unified as a church in love and in our mission of reaching out to our community. We even got to put on our uh, yearly Easter outreach event, and it went really well and we got to share the love of Jesus with our community so financially our people remained strong while I watched other churches struggling our people stayed true to their giving and we were able to, to fund our ongoing ministries our church continues to be a place of welcome and hospitality and acceptance and in the past year we've added 10 new members we started our online ministry something new for us we'd always thought about doing and out of that, we've seen then uh, a ministry to those who couldn't get to church, who were shut-ins and that. And we've also seen a ministry of seeing new people come to our site to take a look and see what we're about and then come join us on Sunday mornings. Young people are starting to come back to church and this is a great, exciting season here at TCC. Praise God for all that he's doing in us and with the whole church in general. So those are three of the stories we've received, and we know that there's a lot more than the ones we have, and we have room for more. So one of the things we would like you to do is uh, throughout the week, if you see someone with a blue lanyard on, I took mine off, but a blue lanyard, that means they're on the leadership team, grab them, and they can take you to a place where the audio is passable, and they will record a video of you talking about whatever the victory in your church looks like. And the point of this is to show people the manifold wisdom of God. Your victory may look nothing like what you saw up there. And we have a lot of different types of victories that we're going to be seeing throughout this week. But the point is, God is doing amazing things through the church, and we want to celebrate all of them. I want to add a story to this. I want to add my own victory. Um, Casey alluded to the year that we had. Um, and this, this will also connect with what I was saying about being, you have to be in the right circumstances to achieve certain goals. In the 12 months since we became presidents, we had our third child. Casey did most of the work. Um, <laughs> it took three trips to the hospital. Within two weeks after the birth, she was back in the ER with appendicitis. Not back in the ER. She didn't go to the ER for the baby. That was planned. But the appendicitis was not. Um, there was another ER visit for another reason. We had two significant staff positions that um, we had turnover in. The company that does most of our online presence decided to 
leave the industry, and we had to, com we had to scramble. Um, we had a lot of projects going on in our church building. And then in February, my 39-year-old brother died. And that was a big deal. Um, we, it's just been so hard to build up any momentum, to feel like we're making progress on anything, to feel like I was in a place where I could do anything to post numbers or be successful or get anything cohesively done. So if you ask me if I have been in a place where I was capable of being successful, that was never even close to my mind. And yet, this year is full of victories. Because in every single one of those situations, I have innumerable stories of how the church came around us and supported us in so many ways. They supported us with prayer. They supported us financially. My staff was amazing in the way they stepped in to take on things that, that were mine, that I couldn't do. Um, my elders were amazing. Our church congregation was amazing. And so much love was shared with us through each of those situations. And I, I cannot say thank you enough. And that doesn't just go for our congregation. That also goes for this network. February is when the Unity Project was supposed to happen. It, didn't have, it ended up not happening for other reasons, and thankfully we're able to still have the same content provided as one of our workshops this week. So if you're, if you're here for Doug Marshall's workshop, you're also here for the Unity Project. Um, but Chris Dunning stepped in and took over my role like that. And one of the best things about convention is the relationships that we build here. And so that when I went through this, my wife and I knew a fellow pastor, a brother in ministry, who was just a few months ahead on the exact same journey. So Daniel Malapudi was able to talk with me, and we were able to support each other in grief. And all of those things, those innumerable things that happened, are absolutely victories that demonstrate the manifold wisdom of God because they can be explained only with Jesus. And so as a person who has been on the receiving end of so many of these victories over the last year, who is here functioning because of those victories that, other people, that God has won through other people, do not miss the power of those. Do not fail to recognize them and to celebrate them and to do your best to continue them because that matters. Because the last thing that I want to make sure that I'm very clear about with you is that I am not abandoning the priority of the growing of the church. I am not abandoning the, the great commission that is on the outside of this building. Be what I'm actually telling you is that the love of God shared through the church is the most powerful, most reliable way to build the church, to grow the kingdom. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to spend a little time with some facts because the last point I have is that God is changing the world through his love expressed in the church. It was Christian love that conquered the Roman Empire. The day before Pentecost, Christianity was maybe 50 to 200 people, depending on how many communities there were around. And within 300 years, it was about 30 million. By 350, it was the majority population in the Roman Empire without even, without being publicly, like becoming the state religion. It was huge. And the question is, how did the early church do that? Well, they didn't do it through massive preaching uh, conversions. It, what we actually find out in a study of history is that preachers don't really convert people from one religion to another. Now, preachers are great at reviving people to a faith they already know, or maybe convincing the Jews at Pentecost that Jesus was the Messiah they were already waiting for. But when someone responds to a preacher, that is a step in a long journey that other people have been investing in them. A preacher does not actually convert someone all the way from one religion to another. So it wasn't great preaching. Uh, it was not um, planned evangelism. In all the hundreds of documents we have from the early church, there is not a single one on evangelism. 
Not a single one. So the evangelism they did, they did naturally. It also wasn't through amazing worship, compelling worship, because for two of those 300 years, they didn't allow non-Christians in the church. They posted deacons outside to make sure that non-Christians didn't come in because of the persecutions. So how did the early church conquer the Roman Empire? They did it by conspicuously loving others. First of all, by loving their families. In the Roman Empire, the father of the family had the power of life and death over parents, children, servants. He was a tyrant. There was no assumption of love, just of power and control. And children that weren't wanted were abandoned. In the Roman Empire, for every 100 women, there were 130 men. That is very unnatural because they didn't value daughters. And then the apostles repeatedly throughout the the letters, they tell Christians to love their families, to love their spouses, to submit to each other, to care for their children, to follow through on their responsibility to their families. And you know what? Those families were strong and they were compelling and they brought in women and children and slaves by droves. They also produced bigger families. The second thing that is emphasized in the, in the New Testament letters is loving your neighbors. And this was a powerful tool for growing the church in the early church because, for instance, just to give you one example, when plagues came through, all the pagans would leave and the Christians would stay and care for the sick. So the pagans would abandon, we have many stories of them just abandoning the sick. Basic medical care will increase your chances of surviving a plague by almost 60%. So coming out of a plague, first of all, there were more Christians, because so the Christians took care of each other. There were also more, more pagans with good experiences of Christians, because if they were cared for by a Christian, which most of them were, they had better chance of surviving. So every time a plague came through, the, the Christians looked a lot better and had a much better impact on their communities. And finally, by that vastly uh, emphasized aspect of loving each other, the church was able to create a community that was compelling enough to convince half the population of the Roman Empire to abandon the cultures they were a part of and to lose all of the attachments that being a Christian would cost them so they could be a part of the church, so they could know Jesus and they could know Jesus' family. And it was through that that the church was built in the early church, that the church was built in the, in the Roman Empire. That was how they conquered the Roman Empire. Christian love has been the greatest force for good that the world has ever seen. It created hospitals, it created charities, and it created universities. Christian love routinely gives more to disaster relief in America than the federal government. Christian love, and hopefully you know this, is growing the church by millions in Africa, in Latin America, in Asia. The church is exploding around the world. It is absolutely exploding, and you can see a lot of evidence of that in the back. Uh, I believe the the greatest density of churchgoers right now is in sub-Saharan Africa. But of course we know that the exception to that is the first world, right? Europe and America. We know that things don't look good there. Well, unfortunately, uh, in our pessimism, we have trusted some bad data. So I'm going to finish this sermon with some statistics. You excited? All right. I hope I remember these in order. The first slide is is a bar chart with small words that you probably can't read, right? Am I right? Okay, so those are the percentages of atheists in a variety of countries around the world. The tallest one is China, which is officially atheist. The other, the next tallest are France and Australia. Notice, first of all, that none of them are particularly tall. But look at the orange ones. You know what those are? Those are former Soviet republics. Across the board, those, those republics had enforced atheism and atheism taught from the schools for 70 years. Look at the long-term impact that had on the growth of atheism in their countries. Practically none. Practically none. In fact, more, far more, uh, rather than being a lost cause, Europe is a source of hope. This next graph shows fertility rates for European women based on how often they attend church. 
You'll notice, so the shortest one is zero, and the highest one is four. That's how many children is, uh, is basically every week. Uh, and you'll notice that the, the tallest one is women who attend church every week. Now, the next slide is the same graph with a line. That line is replacement level. If you are beneath that line, your population is not replacing itself. It is shrinking. If you're above that line, your population is growing. Guess what the only population that is currently growing in Europe is? Practicing Christians. Not even practicing Muslims. Only practicing Christians are a growing population in Europe. And if you combine that trend with the success of evangelism in Europe, what you will find is that in about 100 years, Europe will have a majority practicing Christian population. It is entirely possible that what happened in the early church is happening right now in Europe. But America is a lost cause, right? America is a lost cause. Well, I have one more graph, and I'm going to come down here and check just to make sure that I do this right. Okay, that is a graph of the rates of religious adherence in America uh, from 1776 to 2005. Anybody, is that about what you would expect? Anybody surprised by that? If you're not from my church, you can't answer. They saw this on Sunday. Anybody surprised by that? Would you be surprised to find out that it's backwards? Because it is. In, in 1776, a woman was more likely to get pregnant out of wedlock than to be a member of a church, to be a part of a church, to participate in church. Christians were not even, practicing Christians were not even a majority on the Mayflower, let alone any time in colonial America. And the church has been, has been growing in America ever since. Now, a lot of what we have seen in the decline of the church is actually just the decline of institutional Christianity. Mainline denominations have been declining since 1776. Institutional Christianity has been crumbling because that's what it does everywhere. That's what it's doing in Europe. The problem is they don't actually have enough religious freedom there for there to be other, relig- other denominations competing effectively. But in America, Christianity is actually growing, and it's, and it's doing very well. And the statistics that we're seeing are reflecting problems in certain segments, but the rest of the church is actually making up for it. So what I want to tell you now is what we should know simply because God said it, which is that God's plan can always be trusted, and we can always be optimistic about what God is doing in the world, because God is always winning victories. God is, his plan is always advancing. It doesn't mean in every situation we're only going to experience victories. But it does mean that we don't need to fear. There's too much fear in the church. And we react with that fear with too many attempts to try and control our circumstances. God is in control. The whole world is like this convention. Casey and I are not in control. And if we were, things would have gotten much worse. But God is in control. And he did so many things to make this work out better than we thought and certainly better than we could have. God is in control and God is winning victories. And those little victories that you think are so insignificant that you don't even count them, those have been changing the world for 2,000 years and they will continue to change the world until the day Jesus comes back to finish the job. So never lose the faith that the things you do to show the love of God matter. Never lose the faith that every expression of the love of God is changing the world because the church is advancing, the gospel is advancing, people are coming to Jesus and they are being made better for it, the world is better for it, and one day Jesus will come back and put it finally to rest. And the fact that he's not here yet is actually a reason to rejoice because our God is patient. Our God is patient and he delays so he can save more. That's what Peter tells us. So rejoice in the victories in your church. Be proud of the victories in your church and go back and win more of them and see every chance you have to love others as a chance to win a victory for God in the church that will ultimately contribute to the grand victory of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Dear Father, I am so, so grateful that you are in charge. I am so, so grateful that you are in charge of this convention, that you are in charge of the ministry that is happening in the Northwest, 
that is happening in North America, that is happening in the Western Hemisphere, that is happening in the world. And Father, ultimately, no statistics tell the whole story. Those are our imperfect attempts to describe what is happening and what only you know. But Father, we know what you have said and we trust it. We trust that you are proving your manifold wisdom to the world. And we know by our own testimony that your gospel really does change people. Every one of us is here because we know that your gospel changes people. We know that you truly are wise and that your promises are kept and that you really do change the world. And Father, we are here to celebrate that and to rejoice in that. Father, we are here to confess that it is hard for us with our small window into your plan and into what you're doing to constantly keep the faith. We struggle, just like Jeremiah did. Father, we have anxiety. Father, we experience despair. Father, we see problems in our way the size of mountains, and we forget that you move mountains as a matter of routine. We thank you that you are compassionate with us in our lack of vision. You are compassionate with us in our finite perspective. And we ask that you would encourage us, that you would continually inspire us with glimpses of what you are doing in the world, with the knowledge that the ways we love each other have resounding impacts in the kingdom, that they overwhelm the powers and principalities in the heavenly places. Father, we pray that you would inspire us the vision of what you were doing, that you will give us a desire to win even more victories, to pursue even more of what you are doing in the world. And Father, I thank you for every single church, from the biggest to the smallest, no matter what they are doing, no matter how they fulfill the mission you've given them, I thank you for every victory that you are winning. I pray you would help them to see those and appreciate them. And I pray you would give them more and more victories and light them on fire for sharing your love and building your kingdom. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.